Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Dr. Alan Davies. Well, it, oh, it's on. Thank you. Thanks to all the technical help this morning. And uh, looking forward very much to sharing with you this morning. I'm going to have to head back this afternoon, but I hope I, I can follow up after the talk with anybody who has any questions. Get myself organized. You're intrigued, of course, by the title Nouveau Apprentissage for our international uh, visitors. We are a bilingual country. Uh, that's the extent of my French today. Why? This, it means, of course, the, 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 new, uh, the new learning. Uh, why in French? Well, I was looking for a new way to reflect the resurgence of interest in prior learning assessment and recognition and related matters. Something catchy like, not your grandmother's PLAR, but Diane Conrad already took that. So I came up with this because it sounds sexy and anyway, everything sounds better in French. Nouvelle Cuisine was, of course, the inspiration, and there are actually some uh, interesting parallels. Uh, there are 10 characteristics uh, of this new style of cooking, and uh, later on, perhaps we'll uh, take a look at what the uh, parallels are to teaching and learning. We'll come up with some interesting parallels with the new learning and the new teaching that we're currently facing. The alternative title, I guess a little more prosaic, would be uh, Assessment Competencies and Open Everything as they apply to running a university. Uh, it reflects my interest in how to explore this topic for my institution. And I want to say right out, up front that w when I arrived yesterday and looked through the, the list of participants, not only from higher education, but from Im immigrant services, the skilled trades organizations, government, independent consultants, and of course our international guests, it occurred to me that in fact there could be a fair amount of rolling of eyes as I do some navel gazing about how institutions of higher education need to change and to embrace le nouveau apprentissage. I am from higher education. I've been in education since I was five years old, and I've never been out. I have never had a real job. Uh, but I am kind of humbled when I, uh, my new BFF is Chip Dickinson from the Nova Scotia Boat Builders Association. And when I hear about him doing the authentic assessment of authentic learning for a boat builder, I'm somewhat humbled because the people at the front line really, and a lot of them are here, are probably going to be thinking this guy knows, well, as most presidents do, I know everything, but I know very little about everything. But I hope you find something to take away from this. Um, another possibility, of course, is uh, this notion that we should be practicing what we preach in higher education. It's a fundamental issue of change, which boils down to me to applying the same expectations to ourselves as educators and to our institutions as we do to our learners. We push our learners to expand and analyze and critique and demonstrate and share and evolve in quite a short period of time, usually just a few years. While we as institutions take decades to change anything because somehow what we, can, what we do cannot be fundamentally criticized or expanded or changed except in dark corners or on the margins. Well, we better start off with the disclaimers. This is not in any way a scholarly presentation. It's entirely personal and idiosyncratic. It's the fallout from a blog that I wrote last fall. Uh, then somebody read that and thought it was interesting. And then there was a keynote. And then there was another keynote. And the real reason people keep asking me to do this is because I am a president. It's one of those cases where my position as president seems to impress people. Not often that you get so involved in the frontiers of teaching and learning. We normally play it safe, or we talk about research in a very traditional sense. But you do actually see more of this engagement uh, in the United States, where I was fortunate to work for four years, and I saw presidents being much more daring in many different ways. Plus, I am available, cheap, and willing, and you can consider me a warm-up act for the real experts. So the blog was uh, about the siloing of learning from 
you know, life. Uh, we shouldn't silo learning from life itself because learning is really a natural bodily function that starts in the womb. I talked about cradle to grave, sperm to worm, womb to tomb, forceps to stone, bassinet to box. The whole, you start when you're, when you're conceived and you finish the moment before it is revealed where you're going the next step. I, I assume we're going somewhere when it's all over. I'm counting on going somewhere when it's all over. But through, from the minute you're conceived to the moment you die, you're going to be learning. So why do we silo it away from the rest of, why do we create institutions of learning and kind of compartmentalize it? The second point that I made in my blog was that the most important learning is in fact informal. Whether it's parenting, partnering, palling with people or pets or pastimes, form, the formal part of your learning is actually relatively minor. And I'll make this point several times. What you do with it is more important as a scholar, teacher, or administrator. And when you apply for a job, it is the informal that is assessed. We make multi-million dollar decisions based on subjective assessments of people's experiences and competencies. And I'll come back to that. My blog suggested a re-theorizing of PLAR. I think, I don't know what that means, but I read We Hack and Harris and they said that, and it occurred to me that maybe I was suggesting a re-theorizing, but let's move on quickly. And my last point was that my own institution, KPU, really needed to get on with it. And you can, the blog's still there. Uh, as an open teaching-focused university that claims to be at the leading edge in teaching and learning with research-driven pedagogy, and I quote from our own vision and commitments, KPU needs to get on with this and start really unpacking and rethinking how it teaches and how it assesses learning. Well, that then led to a keynote at the BC uh, Prior Learning Action Network. Thank you. BC Plan was a great meeting in Vancouver, and I talked about personalized and open learning, which then led to uh, an invitation to London and the ePortfolio and Identity Conference, where I waxed on about Marcel Proust therapy at the creative process and the town of Tamar in East, former East Germany, which you can Google if you like. And in the meantime, Bonnie had lined me up for this, and that was before we provided the sponsorship, just so you know. <laughs> uh, there, was, there was no conflict of interest there. I gladly provided the sponsorship, assuming that there were many other institutions, and I realized that we're the only higher education institution. I'm very proud of that. So let's talk about competence. since. I think it behooves me to talk about the theme of the conference, and then I can get rid of that and move on. Uh, let me do a quick overview of this, of competences as, as, as I understand them to be, since that is the focus. And there are so many ways to approach this, and a quick Google search will reveal so many definitions and frameworks about the relationship of competences to skills, outcomes, knowledge, attributes, capabilities, which I'm sure you will be discussing more intelligently later. But let me focus on competencies as they relate to the teaching and learning goals of post-secondary education. So I, and I'm relying here on a presentation of Paul LeBlanc, made last, I don't know how they say Paul LeBlanc in New Hampshire, it might be Paul LeBlanc, I don't know, but Paul LeBlanc, I call him, Paul. Uh, he made it last November at the Council of Adult and Experiential Learning Conference, and Paul is chair of the board of Kale and is president of Southern New Hampshire uh, university. First of all, you've got to tear down what happens today, and Paul does that magnificently. Here is some data quoted from Paul LeBlanc about what is going on in higher education with, res with respect to quality. And I've put the URL on there, and I believe the slides are going to be available if you want to go and check uh, Paul's talk. Uh, not only are, according to Paul, not only are there not enough people graduating to meet projected workforce needs, men, what many of them are learning isn't much. Uh, of course, this is in the United States. We're obviously much better in Canada, right? Right. Plus, uh, tuition and fees have risen faster, nearly two times faster than in healthcare in the US in the last 30 years. And that's because, of course, state support has collapsed. But overall costs anyway have risen faster than every other sector. Of course, this is in the US. That's obviously much better in Canada, right? And why is this happening, Paul says? Well, faculty culture and governance, we're chasing status, craft model of educational delivery, money, outdated knowledge models. 
Why do we have a system, Paul says, that is failing the country? And, of course, he's talking about the U.S. not happening in Canada, right? And then he talks about the competency learning model, uh, which talks about the movement from now until then, from now where passing is the goal, transcript is a black box, time is fixed, three credit courses are the defining unit, there's a mismatch between college and work, workplace expectations, to the future of a competency learning model where mastery is the key, mastery is the goal, what students know and can do is, in, is transparent, students learn at their own pace, learning is defined, competencies are the defining unit, and they reflect the needs of the 21st century uh, workplace. And there's many people who've done a lot of work to figure out, this is one of them is uh, this one, which I don't actually understand the big words, but it impressed me. Uh, it is from the University of Phoenix Research Think Tank, uh, Institute for the Future, unassuming little name. Uh, but I thought that uh, the one that I like more is kind of, is because I'm old fashioned, it comes from uh, American Association of Colleges and Universities, which really is focused on liberal arts colleges and universities, but actually to spend a lot of time and talk to a lot of people about what the what the uh, uh, essential learning outcomes for were for success in the 21st century, knowledge, skills, personal social responsibility, integrative, there's a whole bunch of other um, detail under that if you want to look it up. Uh, many, and many areas, of course, would laugh at us. I was, going to, I was telling Chip earlier he's going to laugh at us, because particularly in the trades, in the skilled trades, not always, but in a lot of the skilled trades, they know what they're doing with respect to this. In art, if you want to be an artist, the, you don't talk about, well, I want to be an artist. You show your portfolio. In music, you play your instrument. Uh, in drama, you perform. In, in some health sciences applied and many professional programs in gen general, you, can, you check to see what people can actually do, not just what grades they have from the tests or contrived laboratory work. And this is, of course, as I said, how we hire people by portfolio, which the academic transcript is but a starting point, if that sometimes. The rest is an assessment of a portfolio through interviews, artifacts, and references, plus probation, until we actually see you in action we don't really know whether you can do the job. It is this focus on what is learned and not how and on what students can do rather than just talk about PLR, PLAR becomes part of a wholesale rethinking of higher education and it's not just a social justice issue, which PLAR used to be strongly associated with, but it's an economic one too. So I'm gonna leave it at that for now and I'm gonna leave you dangling with it, but you have to trust me We'll come back to look at what this means in, in a way one might organize an institution or indeed a system. It's only about a half hour talk, so don't panic. In the meantime, let's talk about me. <laughs> Which is what I really came here to talk about. How did I get to be the president of the largest teaching university in Western Canada? I didn't grow up wanting to be the president of the largest teaching university in Western Canada. I wanted to be an airline pilot. So what was my journey? Well, let's talk about going from me then to me now. The history, the past, the prior learning, if you like. And I'm gonna start where I could start anywhere, but I'll start with my father. My father was the youngest of four brothers and was a nerd. He passed the entrance exams at, to Reading School uh, several times, but my, his parents couldn't afford to send him there because of the foregone income. He never graduated in the sense we understand today. He left as soon as possible to get a job. He became an apprentice uh, gas fitter in the gas company. But then he met my mum, joined the gas company as an apprentice gas fitter, and that would be the end of the story. He'd still be a gas fitter if it were not for World War II. He went off to war as a flight engineer, designed some sort of ready reckoner that allowed calculations to be made quickly about the status of the aircraft. He was, in fact, a mathematical whiz, but was shot down over Germany and spent two years in a prisoner of war camp. He studied informally in prisoner of war camp with a group of Brits, Americans, and others. The Red Cross sent textbooks, 
And when he came home, he wrote his matriculation exams and went to a post-war intense teacher education program and then taught mathematics for 25 years. He was non-traditional, he was an open learner, and education changed his life. So why me? What is my pedigree? Well, there's my father. And then, of course, George, George Bernard Shaw wrote this in Man and Superman, he who can does, he who cannot teaches, off-sighted by people who can't do either. But it does apply to me. I was trained as a research chemist but, and became a chemical educator. And I could talk a little bit later if you want to know why I became a chemical educator. I did quite a bit of outreach to the community when I was an educator. Uh, beyond the classroom, inspired by the fact that my kids were being taught lousy science at school, so I thought I'd better do something about it. I got involved in adult and open learning somewhat accidentally, though inspired by my father, I think, both at the British Columbia Open University, at Athabasca University, and most recently at Empire State College in SUNY, plus, of course, my involvement in Kale and Kepler, etc. But it never occurred to me, why did I get involved in adult and open learning? It wasn't until much later that I realized that I, I think my, my father had planted the seeds for that. But I am a poster child for informal learning. As I said, I am the president and vice chancellor of the largest teaching university in the West with an annual budget of $150 million, 18,000 students, 1,500 employees. But I have no formal education in finance human resources, organizations, administration, higher education, and God forbid, leadership. What I do have is a PhD in chemistry, where I gained transferable skills and competencies. I must say, I learned how to write. I learned how to deal with a lot of data. I, gen I developed the discipline to translate curiosity into some form of cogent investigation to make sense of seemingly unconnected information. Well, that's the formal bit. The rest of, the rest of my competencies, competencies came informally. Teamwork I learned at school. If you could run and carry the ball without dropping it, you were on a team. Uh, it was a very small school and everybody had to play something. I was a Boy Scout where I learned to tie knots and how to make a fire in the rain. Don't laugh, it could be very important. Uh, I went to university where I started meeting friends internationally, dealing with diverse and dis distinctly odd people. As an actor, I spent a lot of time messing around in the theater when I was at London. I spent learning how to get along with creative and some distinctly odd people. When I came to Simon Fraser to study chemistry, I immediately went down to the theater and spent a lot of time working with some distinctly odd people. Can you see which one I am? I, I hope you can pick me up from that. It's not Deborah at the back. You can. And then when I, went, I moved out to Chilliwack, uh, when, I, when I became a chemical educator, but of course I joined the local theater company and became an actor. Uh, well, continued my acting there, working with distinctly odd people, and then I started working with some distinctly odd young people as a playwright and director, learning how to plan for, organize, and manage creative and distinctly odd people. And even at the BC Open University, I was cheap talent as needed for occasional knowledge network productions. Here I am playing Captain Vancouver, discovering Vancouver at English Bay. And as a school trustee, I was 13 years as a school trustee in Chilliwack, learning about public service and local politics, and seeing at first hand what good and bad administration looked like. I am, of course, a father. I have no idea what I learned from that, very little, according to my children. I am a soccer coach, learning how to win and to lose graciously the hard way. And I am an animal lover, which means I've developed skills in nonverbal communication. So I am right now, me now is a collection of uh, documents and photographs and memories and tastes easily digitized into an e-scrapbook and shared by Flickr, YouTube, Spotify. But the professional me cleaned up a bit. 
uh, is uh, available on the website for anyone to read with some hyperlinks to publications and presentations, plus the citation index, presentations, news release, minutes, lawsuits, etc. Uh, but nothing from the people I've truly annoyed. And I have a complex digital identity, as we probably already do, as a citizen, as a consumer, a traveler, a patient, a taxpayer, etc. Some of it public, and some of it, hopefully, still private. Very interesting. So that's me then. What about me in the future? And this is where we get, I think, more to the point. How do I document not just my prior learning and my current identity, but also my emergent learning, because I assume I'm still at it? Well, the two compelling ideas, I believe, that summarize the opportunity and challenge in open education in a, in a digital world are the personal learning environment or the personal learning network and also the e-portfolio. And I'm taught, preaching to the converted, converted, but let me do it anyway. Might give you a different view of it. This is Darcy Norman's uh, very well-developed personal learning environment. It's, it's the nicest looking one on the web. And if you, if you just go looking for them, there's hundreds that you can choose from. But let's build one from scratch just to see how you do that. Well, I want to go from me now to me later. And me later is defined by my goals and my dreams. I want to be closer to those. I want to have 21st century graduate competencies as defined by the AACU. I want to be globally aware and connected and I want to be a lifelong learner with a robust resume that I can share with people. So how am I gonna do that? Well, first of all, I like to link to smart people, people who are smarter than me, and not just at KPU but also uh, people from around the world. And this is easy to do, and I want to be able to sort of browse, and I'm going to have to put my specs on here. I'm going to want to be able to, to, to browse, gather, organize, and read. And there are lots of very inexpensive, or in fact free, tools to allow you to access a huge swath of open uh, resources. Open textbooks now are a, a project in British Columbia, and the, the top 40 courses in uh, British Columbia, college courses are now going to be put available for, in open textbook format. Um, and then, of course, once I've got all that wealth of information from pretty well anywhere in the world that I want to, to search, I want to connect and collaborate, discuss, both on site, whether it, that's on campus, at work, in the pub, or in some community group, or online, and I could use MOOCs or blogs or learning management systems or wikis. There's a variety of ways that you can connect with people with common interests, formally or informally. I also want to be able to share what I know, create, share, and publish, start developing my own work and get feedback on that, and that I can do very easily, very simple tools that either come with your computer or you can, you can download, uh, and of course you can use all kinds of sources to post your information. And lastly, I want to seek feedback uh, and accreditation, and I want then to be, in a sense, classified as a smart person and start contributing. And you can do that in many different ways now. But I've put a few up here. I've, you've got uh, American Council of Education is, is, uh, has uh, done a lot of informal uh, assessment. Um, MOOC providers are starting to do it, Mozilla badges. Learning Counts is the uh, low-cost uh, sort of PLA and assessment uh, uh, function of the Council of Adult Experiential Learning. And I've put one up there, which is Le uh, the Thompson Rivers uh, University Open Learning. They're probably, certainly in BC, they're the leaders in assessing and documenting and compiling uh, uh, prior learning or, in fact, emergent learning. And then, so there are various ways that you can actually get formal recognition and can't start documenting and, and putting on a, some kind of a transcript what it is that you've been learning. And then, of course, I do hope that I go to me now, and of course, I want to build along the way an e-portfolio. We use Mahara, but uh, we're looking at uh, the options that we have there. And uh, there are two other things that I want to say. This is my prior learning uh, this is my uh, personal learning environment. And there are a couple of things I want to say. The first is that it's not a linear process. It's back and forth and swirling around all the time. I, you kind of chunk it out because if I want to use the tools, it's kind of nice to know where they are in some kind of uh, uh, dashboard. Um, but the second thing is the note the use in the middle of the mentor 
we'll call it a mentor, that's the Empire State College terminology, of a mentor, a new role for faculty. Well, it's not actually really new, but this could be the new teaching because everything sounds better in French, le nouveau enseignement. So I'll come back to that in a minute, and if we just go back to our nouvelle cuisine, if you'll remember that nouvelle cuisine has 10 principles, a rejection of excessive complication, cooking times reduced, fresh as possible ingredients, shorter menus, no strong marinades, no heavy sauces, regional dishes, new techniques and equipment, actually using technology, uh, and chefs addressing the dietary needs of their guests and new combinations and pairings. And if you sort of talk about le nouveau enseignement, you can sort of talk about things like back to basic purposes of education, using PLAR to reduce time to degree, dynamic content and open educational resources, a focus on outcomes, open curriculum, teaching with your mouth shut, uh, personalization, effective use of digital technology, engaging students in design of their own programs, and linking across disciplines and beyond. So this silly idea of making it French actually did work out because I thought Nouveau Cuisine could teach us a lot about what it is that we're getting into in terms of the new teaching and learning. So let time now to sort of bring this together and look at what this might mean for institutions. And we'll go back to uh, quote Paul Leblanc, uh, Southern New Hampshire University. In order to address the litany of issues that he perceives in higher education, even in his own very successful traditional not-for-profit private university, he created a separate entity with the unassuming title College for America. I think I'll do that, College for Canada. And like many places, the traditional academy that he runs is actually for 20, 18 to 24 year olds. The interesting part, of course, and for many of us who are involved, is for adult learners, veterans, immigrants, etc. And traditional higher education, again, is defined there. Uh, and then his College for America, he moves to the individual student being at the heart of the model, low cost and free content, competences as defining units, small chunk learning is the way that he defines it, time variable learning is fixed, so it, we're not worried about how long it takes you to achieve these competencies, that you have a mentored peer-to-peer -peer and community learning support model, and learning comes to the students where they live and work, so the, you, you embrace the affordances of online learning to make sure that you create as much flexibility uh, and accessibility for students as possible. So College for America is truly student centers, centered, they can enroll anytime, work anywhere, set their own pace. A, a program aimed at the unconfident learners, as uh, Paul likes to call them, with complicated lives. And they may, in fact, have given up on college. They receive crucial support and coaching to set their goals. Workplace programs provide cohesion and support. The learning model is focused and relevant, values prior learning and experience, and is low cost. And they talk about a $2,500 maximum per year covered by financial aid or company reimbursement or, in fact, of course, by their own funds. And they have a very elegant, very, very simple student dashboard in which they can plan and work and connect. It's very, very nifty and, and uses any device, uh, uh, a regular laptop or desktop or any mobile device. And it's not yet clear what impact College for America might have on the regular campus Though in another example, such an impact is very much anticipated, and I refer to North Arizona University, where they've developed a personalized learning program. And the, uh, the president, John Hager, has made it very clear, with personalized learning, we are opening a new era in academic instruction at NAU. This program is a huge step towards transforming our institution through technology. So, while, while it's happening through, it, the, through, through the Division of Extension, the intent is to actually reverse engineer and impact the way uh, teaching and learning occurs in the major, main part of the institution. So if we go back to my personal learning network, my question is, when you look at all this, can KPU replace some of these dimensions and actually act as the sort of the agent and the repository and the um, the animator of personal learning 
in my personal learning network, always with the faculty in the middle of it doing all kinds of different tasks than they currently do now. Can KPU become a leader for such open learning at every phase with nouveau enseignement, with new teaching? It is happening with fourth year undergraduate research projects and there are lots of individual stories of innovation and openness and flexibility and stories of our students and graduates beating up those from the U15 institutions in case study competitions and in the workplace because they have competencies, not just good grades and immaculate teeth. But any innovation so far is at the discretion of individual faculty and not necessarily focused on the needs of, for instance, adult learners, and certainly not scalable and thus supportable and shareable and saleable to prospective students. It's an interesting place, Quantum Polytechnic University. It's only been around as a full university for about five years, uh, having been a university college and a community college before that. Here's the challenge. First of all, there is little sharing. There's a thousand, it's probably more like 10,000, assuming every faculty member has at least 10 points of blinking light. Randomly, 10,000 points of light randomly blinking amid the darkness, but no way to take stock or leverage innovate this innovation and this very positive work. There is the tyranny of the curriculum, as I call it, the prerequisite, the co-requisite, a tightly structured and sequenced curriculum where PLAR is course-based and not done much anyway. There's not much scholarship of teaching and learning, although we do have, and you, you've probably met uh, or will meet Diane Salter, our Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, who has a new institute for uh, scholarship and innovation in teaching and learning, which is being established at the institution to really try to bring together a profile for uh, scholarship. We pride ourselves on our teaching innovation is that we have small classes very small classes in some cases. Nothing, you, there is no class bigger than 35 seats times four sections times two, that's the workload, it's in the collective agreement. And you, you walk along the corridor and you see row upon row of students facing the front in a very tra traditional sort of very small lecture format. Now once you get in the classroom there's all kinds of magic happening because it's a, it's a, it's a highly engaged model. But it's very structured and we spend a lot of time a lot of time talking about this structure and, and it's all administrative rather than actually talking about the teaching. There is little appetite to really assess teaching. Just having small classes equals excellence. That's the assumption. Even though there is quite a lot of data to say that we can do better. Students who transfer often tell us that they have a better experience to the place they've transferred to than they did with us. Um, the student satisfaction data is very strong but it's not perfect. <laughs> And uh, the, the Quantland Student Association has asked me to establish an ombudsperson so they have somewhere they can go when they have issues with what's going on in the classroom. They, they don't really get much satisfaction right now. And we don't even have a Senate committee on teaching and learning. We will talk forever about anything in governance, but not teaching per se, which is very interesting for a teaching university. So there is huge inertia to substantial change, and thus we do not practice what we preach. We do not hold ourselves to the same expectations as we do for our students, where it is not good enough to say you are good, you need to prove it. You need to be open to feedback. You need to learn from each other. You need to develop competencies that can be assessed and validated, and not just blame everyone else when the grade is not very good. We are quite typical, I think. We are faculty-centric, we are administratively expedient, we are obsessed with the documentation of curriculum and with little attention to alternative open and adult learning, but with a huge focus on the 18 to 24 year olds. Although, having said that, this new way of thinking about teaching and learning is not just for adults and the usual non-traditional learners. Anya Kamenetz talks about this as a remedy for the high costs and providing more flexibility for young, wired students who have access to a world of free resources. And it's always fun to listen if you read uh, Anya's blogs and follow her on Twitter. She's uh, pretty wild and crazy about this. And then there is the KPU School for Open Studies. This is my version of the College for America. 
we are looking at some sort of separate entity. It might be a school, it might be an office, it may or may not involve faculty directly, or certainly involve faculty in the academic parts, but how we get organized. We're looking where we can foster such activity, uh, where it would offer a small number of open degree programs that enable personalized degrees, so very, very uh, broadly defined competencies for our degrees. Uh, where it would house the PLA process, where it would offer an e-portfolio for life, where it would promote innovation, uh, open educational resources, independent study, etc., a whole range of things that we want to get involved in. This, would, this could be the site for that. And we would ask our Senate for variances to current pro policies to enable that, short-term variances, so that we can then come back and codify them in due course and rewrite policy. Rather than waiting for all the ducks to be in a row, give us a break, we'll come back to you when we need to codify what it is that we've learned. And there is some appetite for that in the institution, I must say, because everybody's struggling to figure out how do we get ourselves out of this box that we've created of timetable and room bookings and curriculum and be able to do some of these interesting things. So some of you from Empire State might recognize this diagram. Too bad. I made it, so I'm using it. So here's the, in the School for Open Studies, or the Office for Open Studies, we'd operate on the assumption that learners bring with them three types of prior learning. There is the formal learning, obviously the documented, transcripted learning, the experiential learning that we can obviously uh, help, the learning purely through experience, and then documented learning, learning that people have already had assessed and documented, which we would then accept. And then they come to us, they can work with a faculty member to have their formal and formal documented and undocumented learning assessed with a network of assessors who will be faculty, who are appropriately trained in assessment, who explore the field through research to develop a personalized competency-based degree plan which is approved by the appropriate faculty. And then, of course, the learner can complete the degree plan through KPU coursework offered in various formats and via other institutions open degrees with low residency uh, that they can complete either with us or through other institutions if we don't offer what they need. That will then, uh, they will concurrently build a learning e-portfolio for life, which can then document their emergent collegiate and non-collegiate learning, because one of the things we forget about prior learning assessment is that people now will increasingly will continue to learn and they'll do it in non-formal ways, we need to be able to, for them to continuously populate their e-portfolio, uh, their non-collegiate learning and competencies from their ongoing KPU studies, from their new experiences, their training, their professional development, their use of open educational resources, their MOOCs, etc. And of course, they can use this for seeking employment from which new learning can also be documented and added to their learning portfolio. So by offering the portfolio for life, we can, of course, maintain a long and fruitful relationship with our graduate, not just for the purposes of fundraising, but because that's the right thing to do, is to maintain that connection with your alumni and alumna. Now, this is all very conceptual and will require considerable rethinking of the status quo, both academically and administratively, but even the discussion, even the discussion of this new school or office provides a catalyst, I hope, for engaging in the important discussion of how the institution can hold itself to the same expectations that we have of our learners. And I think this is a very good time to be rethinking and reinventing PLAR, being rooted but not limited by our past achievements. Thank you very much. <laughs>